Well, thank you. For, uh, again, it's uh, a pleasure to be back at, uh, at BlenderCon. Uh, last time was about two years ago, uh, where I was also talking about the future of rendering. Uh, so, you know, at Otoy and the Render Network, uh, our goal has been to democratize content creation. And of course, you know, Blender, I think, has led the way in that. Um, it's been an incredible uh, partnership to, uh, to work with the Blender Foundation so closely and to be part of um, the Blender community. Uh, this talk is about the future of rendering. And I have to say that this year in particular, I keep updating my slides almost every week because there's so many things that are changing and, and moving so quickly. But I've been giving these talks for about 20 years. And going back about 10 years, if you look at my slides from when we launched Octane Render, which was you know, really one of the first GPU renders along with Cycles, um, you know, I had this sort of 10-year trajectory. And I would also uh, often invoke uh, John Carmack, Tim Sweeney, uh, two uh, brilliant minds that I, I worked with a lot over the last decade. And I asked Carmack um, to really sort of give his take on something that I think is really important, which is, you know, at what point does neural rendering take over for rasterization and ray tracing? And, uh, you know, there's this big kerfuffle uh, earlier this year where uh, Microsoft had sort of rebuilt uh, a world model around uh, Quake. And, you know, Carmack and Tim both were like, well, you know, it's basically, it's okay. I mean, you know, AI is going to be a big part of the future of rendering. And I wrote an email to Carmack around April of this year, and I said, what's your take on it? Like, how, how long until, you know, Jensen's prediction that every pixel will be nearly rendered will come true? And he said about 10 years. Um, in the meantime, there are going to be different stages and steps where you'll have AI filtering, rasterization, and ray tracing. Um, and I think that that's probably about right. Uh, you know, this is this full, full email to me. Um, but I think there is always the chance that something will surprise us. And in fact, um, Genie 3, which was uh, a world model that is not out publicly, but it's in beta testing at Google. I'm going to play a little bit Each of the video for that announcement. Each one of these is an interactive environment generated by Genie 3, a new frontier for world models. With Genie 3, you can use natural language to generate a variety of worlds and explore them interactively, all with a single text prompt. Pretty Let's remarkable see what stuff. Like In the interest of time, I'm probably not going to play the whole thing, but you should, if you haven't seen Genie 3 or seen this video, go and check it out. It's pretty incredible. And a lot of the things we'll be talking about are how far are we from that being on a single GPU and for neural rendering to be completely rendered without any triangles, without any polygons. Um, it's something that is definitely uh, on everyone's mind, and, and on mind especially. Um, Focusing, though, on the cloud, uh, where we have many GPUs, we have the render network. Uh, we've been focusing on workloads uh, for decentralized rendering, where we use consumer GPUs, bridge, bridge those together, give you a much cheaper price than Amazon or the centralized cloud providers. And there's a lot of use cases for that that affect Blender users, um, you know, whether it's uh, doing uh, scene assembly, which is something that agents can do really well, or just traditional rendering. We added cycles uh, to the render network, which is awesome. So we now have projects that are being done on the render network that utilize cycles. Um, Octane, of course, is also on there. The render network, because it has tens of thousands of GPUs, is useful for things like the Sphere. Uh, NASA uses it. It's used in you know, film and production work. Uh, and I think that you know, our goal of investing uh, what we can into the Blender Foundation has been to try to bridge pieces of Blender um, and cycles into the network even more concretely. We've also been using Blender in production. We do a lot of work with Paramount on Star Trek. Uh, Blender is used by about half of our art team. And we've been building many different tools to link Blender to Unreal and Max and, and many other DCCs. A uh, recent project that uh, just came out uh, in New York, it's, a, um, uh, it's an installation that has 18K, 270-degree projections. All of that was rendered in cycles on Blender on the render network. And this kind of workflow is not just production ready, it's also something that leverages the decentralized cloud that we've built to deliver experiences that are way beyond um, film and, and TV. It's, it's pretty exciting to see that come together. Uh, back to the future of rendering, again, these world models that Carmack was talking about, I think there's something really intriguing about even exploring video models today. So when Sora was first announced in 23, I immediately you know, just like probably many others, notice, you know what, there's a 3D world that's in latent space, right? It's not a Gaussian splat, it's not a, it, it's somehow 
this thing is able to have enough memory of the scene that you can extract a 3D model or a splat out of it, which is what I'm showing here. And sure enough, that is what's going on. I mean, Sora has actually fallen out of favor. There's so many video models now that are better. And there are world models now, um, for example, one from World Labs that was just announced a few days ago that spits out Gaussian splats. But I think the real goal is, can you render an object neurally? Can you take a 3D object or anything from the scene graph, turn it into a latent space object, and then use neural rendering to give you really fast, real-time rendering that is as good as um, you know, speed-wise and interactive-wise as what you get with rasterization or ray tracing, but at a quality um, that is effectively as good as path tracing, but free. And I think that's possible. I mean, effectively, neural rendering is a form of compression. And we've had success earlier this year in taking things that come out of these neural rendering models and turning them into objects that are neural objects inside of Octane that can be path traced, relit, um, at some point even deformed. Uh, there's also a lot of utility for having neural rendering be applied over scenes that can basically add you know, volumetrics and hair and fur and things like that that are difficult to animate and difficult to simulate. Um, in the case of just you know, general video models, you know, we still have not been able to get production ready rendering out of these yet. Um, that keeps changing. I think these things keep getting better. Um, and I think probably by the end of this year, we'll start to see some really good quality out of these newer models. I mean, I think when I was first making these slides, VO3 hadn't even come out. Um, and since then, you've seen a lot of improvements on Kling, on Cdance, and others. Um, but as far as the workflows that we want to provide to artists, last November, we added um, about seven or 10, I guess, uh, different neural uh, rendering tools on our cloud rendering service. And today, we're relaunching that service on O2AI with 700. So it's a 100-fold increase. And there's a, pretty much every single AI model or neural model out there is something that we want to expose on this service. We're going out there and working with other partners like Runway and Higgsfield. I love the Higgsfield stuff to try to bring all these tools into one place. And you can see here the uh, sites in beta right now. But you can have all these different tools that allow you to play around with um, you know, taking things from concepts, th things that come out of your render can go into the system. More interestingly, you can actually you know, iterate pretty quickly on designs that you can turn into 3D models, 3D scenes. And the idea is you can bring those into Blender. You can render them with Cycles or Octane. And that's what we're showing here. So there is, I think, a value to having every single possible tool that you can imagine that is you know, in this world of neural rendering you know, uh, available for cheap through the render network where possible and you know, into, into the DCCs and also uh, inside of a web page. Um, a lot of the um, you know, video models you see today are exposed on, on the browser. And we're sort of doubling down on that as well. We can even bring instances of cloud-rendered or cloud-hosted Blender into the, um, uh, into the system. There are a lot of useful tools. Like you can take two frames, and you can basically do 4K interpolated rendering. Um, we are also building tools. This is also in the browser for basically a 4D timeline, where you can you know, basically take these outputs and reassemble them as splats or as objects, or even pulling in a, a cloud renderer out of Blender or Octane and uh, assembling those together. So some of those things you'll see in production. And uh, we also have uh, an editor for assets that is, you know, allows you to mix 3D objects and uh, neural uh, generated objects together. Uh, and there's also a full node graph, a lot kind of inspired by Comfy UI, but simpler and easier to use. And all of this is. Uh, you know, on uh, our beta site today. And if you're interested, please sign up. We'd be happy to give you guys uh, an early trial. So for production rendering or production work, uh, the neural workflows that we've developed that are not yet on this service, but they're coming soon, include things like um, makeup transfer. And uh, if you're fans of The Penguin or seen that show, Colin Farrell wears about, I don't know, takes about four hours in the makeup chair to get him ready for this uh, performance. And one of the tests I had our team do was, can we take basically that prosthetic and apply that as a neural object with our tech um, and do that in real time? And the answer is actually, yeah, we can take that and do that. So this is a tool that is useful for physical productions where you have um, prosthetics or makeup, and you, just need, you can just skip that step and apply that in real time onto somebody's face. This is me wearing the penguin makeup in real time, running on a single GPU. Um, and that's pretty cool. So a performer and actor can basically see what they're doing. And, they, uh, and anything that you can create in the physical world or that's a physical prosthetic can be mapped to this system. Um, when it's something that isn't there, like obviously Leonard Nimoy has passed for you know, over 10 years, 
um, this is an actor playing him for one of our Star Trek projects. Uh, this is an offline renderer, and this is rendering at 6K, but again, the actor is able to perform in real time, see what they're doing, and basically both the real time and offline version of this tool is something that we're gonna be putting on, on the service. Um, you can also take these, um, these renders and you can freeze them and bring them into a 3D um, pipeline, as I was showing before. Relight them, um, look at them from any angle. Uh, the trick is basically being able to drive a path tracer with a real-time performance, which we're, which we're working on. Um, a lot of the Star Trek stuff that you're seeing is actually being applied for a project that I'm very proud of. I've shown that uh, before, about two years ago here. Uh, the Gene Roddenberry Archive is uh, actually something that's Got a lot of attention, um, both for its historic um, approach to preserving the history of Star Trek and also recreating every aspect of Star Trek digitally, one-to-one uh, -one digital doubles of the USS Enterprise. Um, I think the thing that we're probably, um, that's gotten the most attention out of this project have been the shorts that we've done using all these tools, some of which you saw uh, earlier. Um, the last time I was here, uh, I was showing a, a, a two-minute short that we had created in 23 and got full million views, people loved it. We followed that up last year with another short, uh, Star Trek short called Unification, and that has 40 million views and it just blew the lid off, off of uh, you know, the house, I guess, for Star Trek fans at least. And I'd love to show a little bit of that um, and talk about how we made it and the tools that we used to, to bring that together. Of course, a lot of this, you know, the CG assets were done in Blender, um, but there's a lot of um, workflows that were leveraging all the things you've just seen for this production. So I'm gonna play about a minute of the clip and then I'll show more of the behind the scenes. So there's the whole clip's eight minutes, we don't have time to show it all, but if you uh, go to ronnenberry.x.io, you can watch it all there, along with the other four that we've done. And, uh, you know, obviously bringing Kurt back was a really big deal. Uh, we did it, of course, with the um, participation, cooperation, and oversight of William Shatner. Uh, the premiere of this short was in New York, uh, and you know, he was there, and, and it was a really emotional thing for him. He, uh, he agreed to do it basically because he really did miss uh, Leonard Nimoy. You know, was, they were like brothers, and he never really got to say goodbye to him. The last six months, they didn't, they didn't speak. This project was really a way for him to sort of bridge that gap. Um, and we did sort of consider de-aging Bill to, to be Kirk. Um, in the end, we went with an actor, a uh, very well-known actor, actually Sam Witwer, uh, who uh, plays Darth Maul. He's known for a lot of uh, genre roles in Battlestar Galactica. He played our young Captain Kirk. And uh, him and Bill basically, you know, effectively shared the role. Bill did voiceover work for the project. Uh, and you can see some of the tests that we did early on to try to make this all work. I mean, in the short itself, you see uh, Kirk at different ages. And the first test that we did when we were sort of going over the tech with Bill was to show him de-aged. And he said, oh, that looks great. Um, but I want to see what it looks like if I don't have to show up on set. And so that's where we Cruise. did our test with Sam. Do you down in six months? We've done our bit for King and Country. And that looked perfect. And Bill was like, well, he looks just like me. He obviously spent, you know, he did spend two years trying to study how to be Kirk. And we went with that. And so this is in real time on a 4090, the first test we did with Sam uh, with a face replacement as Kirk. And it's pretty remarkable. That kind of workflow is, is amazing. And it's very human and it's very artist-centric because you have an actor who is basically driving this performance um, with a CG face. And we don't have to put dots. We're using a lot of new technology on a GPU to basically drive this and make it work 
in real time. And I think without that real time aspect, it would be very difficult to get a good performance, a good DH performance out of, uh, out of this technology and out of this pipeline. Uh, we're also applying that to future projects. So one of the characters in Star Trek uh, is from the cartoon in the 70s. His name is Arix, and he's got three arms. Definitely, you know, you can't just really put somebody in that, uh, you know, in, in sort of the, uh, makeup. So we basically sculpted the, uh, you know, the head, and we started to build the body, and we actually built an animatronic Arix because in the end, we want to be able to really drive this physically with actors on set. Uh, so you can see here is the uh, rubber uh, animatronic, which, of course, doesn't have all the texture and color on there. Um, but what we're testing is being able to take that and then apply, effectively, a neural filter, a neural render from the CG model onto that, um, onto that performance with eyes blinking and everything. And it's looking pretty good. I think it's going to work. Uh, and we're going to do the same thing for sets. So we did a lot of set replacement. We filmed on location, of course, uh, for the garden scene you saw. Uh, but in a lot of cases, we also rebuilt and scanned everything in CG. So being able to bring those together, mix those together, and even direct some of these elements more in real time is definitely something we want to do in the future. Uh, and then as we're gearing up for what we're doing next on the project, in the piece that we did uh, with Kirk and Spock reuniting, they didn't say a word to each other, uh, other than uh, Bill Shatner's voiceover. But we did do tests where that's possible. A lot of people you know, were sort of looking forward to, to seeing that. Um, and so I'm going to share just some internal tests that we did, uh, and they could be used for something in the future, uh, with um, Sam Witwer and Lauren Selleck playing Kirk and Spock as they appeared in the 1979 motion picture. I think I like that, Mr. Spock. I commanded a ship named after an idea. So when we were showing this to um, Adam Nimoy and the Nimoy estate, they were really, I mean, even Bill, I mean, they were really thinking this looks like it was filmed in 79, like my father was on there, my you know, husband, this is the Nimoys. And I think the, uh, the magic of being able to, to really go and, and bring back any part of Star Trek with actors that are you know, as, as devoted to this uh, franchise and the storytelling and the, you know, basically the vision that Gene Roddenberry had as we are is pretty fantastic. Um, and sort of a last word on that, I'll, I'll play another thing here. That we see on Star Trek at the holodeck. What kinds of things can you imagine that are partway there that could be much better than the three-window eye chat that we might see in the next five or ten years? Well, I don't, I don't think Steve's going to announce his transporter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want Star Trek. <laughs> Just give me Star Trek. <laughs> Yeah, and that's how I feel too. I think that the vision that we have for the future of rendering very much is in line with the Star Trek holodeck. And you've had folks for, for decades, I think, that have really been you know, enamored of that vision. And I think you know, what really has brought us all here is you know, when you think about the Star Trek holodeck and how magical it is where you effectively can create stories, share those stories, uh, build experiences that are interactive and both linear. I mean, it really does sort of come together and converge really nicely. And I think that, you know, the, um, the Blender Foundation has done such incredible work. Um, we're doing our part, I think, to, to provide what we can to support it and to provide tools and services for artists um, to, you know, really expand and build on what Blender can do. And uh, with that, um, I want to do a couple of housekeeping items. We, if, for anybody who wants to scan this code or go to the link, we are giving away uh, 50 euros worth of render credits. So, if you want to use that to uh, try the render network out and some of the new tools, please go ahead and uh, avail yourselves of that. And we will continue talking about the future of rendering um, into next year at uh, our second annual render conference, uh, April 16th to 17th in Los Angeles, 2026. Um, and uh, we had a great event last year, uh, so hopefully some of you guys will be able to make it there. And uh, with that, thank you all very much. And a pleasure.